All right, so when we look at how humans are constructed, you see we're designed for walking while foraging. We have a completely unprotected uh, exposed anatomy. If we run up behind uh, an animal and start pestering it, we're likely to get kicked in our abdomen, which means that we can be disemboweled, or we get kicked someplace lower, and Lord knows, God help us. Uh, we, and instead of presenting the smallest area or cross-section to the wind, we actually present the widest area of our body as a cross-section to the wind. That, again, means that we are inefficient runners. But why would nature do that? Why would nature have us, or God, if you will, have us present the widest area of our body as a cross-section to the wind when we're moving forward? It's because it's designed to create a bunch of air currents swirling about our body. What would be the point of that? What is your radiator for in your car? Cooling. Cooling. And what does your radiator cool in your car? Your engine. So what do we have that we need to keep cool on our body? Huh? Okay, I've heard skin. Actually, the skin is the radiator. But what is the skin designed to cool? Muscle. Uh, that's a good thought, but that ain't it. Huh? Organs. Which one? The heart. Actually, the heart, there's so much blood flowing through the heart, the heart stays nice and cool. The brain! Yes! Do you know that every day... Your brain, which only accounts for 3% of your body weight, uses 25% of the energy you burn. Your brain alone. That means every given minute, your brain is generating gigantic amounts of heat. But it's enclosed in bone, and heat does not radiate across bone. So the only way to get that heat out of the skull is the same way your car engine gets rid of its heat. It circulates water through the engine to pick up the heat, takes that out to the radiator, and releases it to the environment. Our bodies do the same thing with our naked skin. The blood, uh, um, the, the brain receives 20% of the heart's cardiac output. So any given moment, 20% of your blood is flowing through your, through your brain, picking up all that heat, bringing it out to your skin, and releasing it to the environment. The back of my shirt right now is, is, is wet, and by the end of this lecture, it's going to be soaking wet. And that's because I'm using my brain to talk to you, and it's generating a lot of energy. And my body's getting rid of it by bringing it up to my skin. So that's why we have these flat, non-aerodynamic bodies and naked skin so that we can help get rid of all of this uh, uh, excess heat produced by our brains. Now, why, again, why is that important? Well, what is the normal temperature for a human body? It's about 98.6 degrees. What happens if your core temperature gets up to 104 degrees as an adult? Yeah, you die. You're, get, you're dead, you're gone. That's like six degrees, ladies and gentlemen. So that means that the brain is exquisitely sensitive to uh, elevations in temperature. It's got to be kept cool to function properly. Anybody here ever have a high fever? I once had uh, the, like a flu-like illness, and my temperature got up to 103. And I'm telling you, I felt like I was walking around encased in cotton. I couldn't, I mean, it's, it's like I could barely think. The human brain does not like elevations in temperature, and it's got to be kept cool. And that's why we have the body structure we have. We also have heavy, straight, pillar-like legs with these loose, mobile joints that make our walking very efficient. Very large, heavy, flexible feet, uh, hairless skin, flat, blunt nails. And essentially, our lifestyle factors make us invulnerable to predation. And our slow speed and poor endurance are really most useful for escaping stinging insects, but are useless for um, uh, chasing down uh, any prey. Now, that's, that's kind of a, uh, you know, a glib thing to say. Oh, it's, it's useful for uh, uh, escaping insects. 
How do I know that? Okay, how fast is the fastest human being? Usain Bolt, at his fastest. He, runs, he hits maybe about 25 to 26 miles an hour. And, and most of us can't even get close to that. How uh, uh, long can a human being maintain top speed? You've all seen the Olympics. No, no, I'm talking about distance-wise. No, top speed. All right. In the, in the 100 meter dash, the guys are still running full bore, right? But what happens in the 200 meter dash? In the last 50 yards, they start slowing down. And that's because we can only maintain top speed for about 150 yards. How fast do bees and wasps fly? 20 miles an hour. How far will they chase you around their nest? 200 meters. Again, our running ability is meant to help us get away from stinging insects while we're out foraging for food. But there is no uh, animal that you can chase down in 200 meters, uh, um, especially as slow as we are, because they would be halfway across the savanna. It gets even more interesting because clearly, Pregnant human women are absolutely incapable of, of hunting. They can't go out and wrestle with some animal or chase it down um, because they would kill themselves and their baby. So how did, you know, anthropologists deal with this? Well, since the early anthropologists were men, they made crap up. And they said, well, you know, the women hung out at the door of the cave waiting for the man to bring home the bison. And you know what Mo Mother Nature said? She said, bull crap. Because there is no species in nature where the female of the species is unable to procure the food she needs for her own life and to support a pregnancy and raise her young. Nowhere in nature. Because Mother Nature knows what every single woman in this room knows, and that is that men are too damn undependable to stake your life on them, okay? So it's ludicrous to postulate that, um, human, that the human species would uh, um, create a situation where a pregnant woman would have to be dependent on a man who might get killed and not be able to, to uh, bring her to the foods that she needs to survive. Female of every species is always able to procure the food that she needs. The long gestation period of humans is typical of large herbivores, as we'll see. And human fetal development suggests being an herbivore was a pre necessary prerequisite for our brain development. Single births are the rule with humans, with occasional twins. And our babies are large relative to their, mother, to their mother's body weight, which again is typical for herbivores. And babies are born with their eyes open, which is a sign of brain development. So this is a uh, chart showing you the length of gestation for carnivores versus herbivores and humans. And you see the carnivores all have very short gestation periods. Um, the longest is roughly about 16 weeks in a lion, but that's very short. Um, and that's because a heavily pregnant female can't be out there chasing down and wrestling with an animal because she'll kill herself and her young. So they have their babies at a very immature stage of development and essentially the babies uh, finish their development outside the womb. Whereas, you see, the herbivores all have very long gestation periods of 40 weeks or more. Human beings are right there with the rest of the herbivores. Let's look at neonate birth weight as a percentage of the mother's body weight. Again, gigantic differences. Carnivores have tiny little babies. Herbivores have, relatively speaking, huge babies. When you look at the, the uh, neonate's birth weight relative to the mother's body weight, the herbivores invest a lot more energy uh, and, uh, into their babies than the carnivores do. That's why carnivores have litters, expecting a lot of them to die. The herbivores have one or two babies, expecting to expend a lot of time, attention, and energy to keep that baby alive. 